Hello, everyone. I don't think I even need this. Is this on? Great. OK, welcome. We're so glad to have all of you here at uh, what we're calling the uh, Tar Heel Tailgate Talk ser Series, T-H-T-T -T -T Series, the Tar Heel Tailgate Talk Series. Anyway, this is an idea that we had um, to really try to bring uh, some of our faculty and people that are par associated with the university here to have talks and to talk about subjects that we know are of great interest to many people. So we've just started the series. We've had a few. They've been really exciting talks. And in addition to having them um, for people that are here present, we also put them on YouTube. And so we've been finding a lot of people go back and look at them and have a chance to really watch them. And we're very excited about it because they've been covering a broad range of topics. Um, mostly topics that have to do with things that people that live in the region are really excited to know about. And today is a very special one because we're getting to talk about something that we all love, food, and we're getting to hear about it from people that are experts in that area. It's fantastic for us because it also goes together with our food theme, which is really important for the university. It's our unifying theme for at least the next two years, food for all. So um, we're, we're happy to have every opportunity to bring people together to talk about that theme. So I'm going to start by introducing Marcy Cohen Ferris. I'm sure all of you actually know her, uh, award-winning faculty member. She has research and teaching interests uh, that include Southern history and culture, particularly what we call foodways, and um, the American South, and the history also of the Jewish South. She's been one of our leaders for this food theme. She is present and active in so many different areas of this uh, campus and this region. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Marcy, who will introduce Debbie. Thank you. And I'd like to really thank Chancellor Folt for making this theme possible. The funding comes from her office and that of the provost, and it's really exciting to have this academic theme. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about that and also just give you a five seconds about food studies here at the university if you're wondering, what does it mean to study food and how come they didn't do that when I was here? <laughs> Yeah, things have gotten really great. And also, be sure to pick up a food theme sticker. And you know where you put these? On your laptop, of course. You know, we're trying to be up to date. All right. So, food for all. I'm co-chairing the theme with my colleague, Alice Ammerman. And Alice directs UNC Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. And she is a professor of nutrition in the Gilling School of Public Health. So, you see happens here. The theme and the goal for Food for All is to really motivate conversation and research about food-focused scholarship and public engagement because, of course, we're Carolina. So this is happening on campus. It's happening throughout the state. It's ha we're connecting nationally and we're connecting globally. We had an amazing speaker yesterday, Shingain Fon, who came and spoke about his hunger initiatives around the world. He works for an international focused um, institution and group in D.C. and that was a full huge number of students, 300 students at a 12.30, you know, uh, talk yesterday. And so that food theme is really engaging food scholarship across the university and bringing together faculty that might not know one another. You know, and I, I met Alice probably 10 years ago, and we've worked really closely together from the humanities and the social sciences. And then just a little bit about food studies. You know, Carolina has been an international leader in food cultures and nutrition and public health for a very long time. And in the 1920s, we can go back and see that UNC sociologist Howard Odom and his colleagues introduced the discipline of what was called regional sociology. And that was confronting contemporary problems in the American South. They looked at, along with other issues, malnutrition, diet, the food habits of Southerners, and that was chief among their concerns. And we were just talking when, uh, you know, we were listening to, to Mr. Shen, to Mr. Fon yesterday, and he was speaking about contemporary malnutrition, and we were making the links to what that looked like in the South, the differences between the pellagra of the 1920s and obesity today, but both different forms of malnutrition. So today, there are probably now over 50 related 
courses uh, across disciplines at the university related to food studies. Um, our undergrads may minor or major in food studies. There's a, they can do this through an interdisciplinary studies department. We're launching a brand new course, and that's one thing that the food studies theme is doing. It's offering micro grants to students, to faculty, to community members to develop research and new courses. So we've got a new introductory food studies course that's going to be team taught by a lot of these faculties beginning in the fall. And I brought with me, and I'll put them out on the table afterwards, we've got several publications that are focusing on the food theme and what's happening with food studies, our own Southern Cultures that's published by the University of North Carolina Press and comes out of the Center for the Study of the American South, does a special food issue just about every year, and this is our, our, our current issue. So, oh, and then we've got a new course too, the, just the second time Rob um, has videoed and come and visited our class before, uh, called Carolina Cooks, Carolina Eats, North Carolina Food and Culture, and Debbie, you'll be coming to speak to that. And we're working from that class on a publication, it'll be called, Carolina Cooks, Carolina Eats, and North Carolina Atlas on food and culture, and we're hoping that UNC Press publishes that for us. So let me tell you about Debbie Moose, because she's been an integral part of food studies and food journalism here in North Carolina, and I work with her through another organization called the Southern Foodways Alliance. We were just at the annual symposium at the University of Mississippi. So Debbie. Um, is a North Carolinian through and through. She was born in Charlotte. She grew up in the foothills of Winston-Salem. And she earned her degree in journalism from UNC. And she began working as a reporter, first for the Salisbury Post and then for Raleigh's News and Observer. She has a monthly column that I know many of you know, Sunday Dinner, that has appeared in the News and Observer since 1998. And her work is, she's published widely, Our State, Southern Living. She was one of the inaugural uh, writers for Cornbread Nation One, the best of Southern food writing that was organized and has been continually by the Southern Foodways Alliance. So growing up in the Piedmont, Debbie's parents tended and had such a large vegetable garden that they never even had to buy canned vegetables or tomato sauce. And their you know, she really learned about the wonderful, fresh flavor of real food and of fresh, local, seasonal ingredients from North Carolina. So she combined her interest in food and writing as the editor of the News and Observer's food section for seven years, and twice during that period, it was named best section in the United States by the Association of Food Journalists. And today, Debbie Moose is a national award-winning freelance writer and teacher. She also, in her spare time, which she has none, cook, teaches cooking classes and writing workshops. And I, additionally, you play Celtic fiddle. I, okay, fine. And, Dan, and then she's also now learning to be an improv comedy theater person. So it's just a little crazy. Um, she is an ardent college basketball fan forever. Uh, she lives, and she's here with her husband, Rob. They live in Raleigh. She has a terrific blog called Moose musings at debbiemoose.com. Many, Debbie is widely published, but I wanted to focus on two books that are published by UNC Press as part of their Savor the South series. One on buttermilk, an essential Southern ingredient, and another on, another on Southern holidays, which is terrific. And then Debbie has a great book out um, called Fanfare, a playbook of great recipes for tailgating or watching the game at home, and she can tell you how to get copies of that, too. <laughs> Debbie, come on up. Well, thank you, and I want y'all to know that if it had been up to Marcy, we'd be having this talk in the bouncy house out there right now, because she, uh, she was seriously wanting us to decamp out there. Um, the other thing I should probably tell you is that um, in addition to my parents raising me to love fresh vegetables, my father raised me to have Carolina blue blood. Um, when I was a kid, he, he loved basketball. We'd watch basketball on TV. When I was a kid, he had me convinced. He would tell me that they called him Dean Smith because he was dean of the whole school. <laughs> and my mother would go, stop telling the child that. Stop telling the child that. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very proud to be an alum as, as my husband is. We met here, and he was dating my roommate, but that's a whole other sordid story, um, which I could tell you later if you like. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that 
tailgating actually started before there were real, actually cars. Now, it wasn't called tailgating, but the concept of the celebratory consumption of food and drink in anticipation of a sporting event um, existed um, as early as 1869. Now, Princeton and Rutgers claim that they were the site of the first tailgate because people would arrive for their games um, in carriages and they'd bring picnics with them. So they would unpack the carriage, you know, put the picnic out and eat that. Now Yale claims they were the first in 1904 because people would come by train with their food and their picnics and, and unpack before the game. So however you want to define it, tailgating has been probably going on at least 100 years in some form um, of the non-car variety. Um, and since then, I mean, it has just spread across the country like the smoke from sizzling burgers and like the sound of that band that we hear coming through that sidewall. Um, and what I discovered in working on fanfare um, was that tailgate customs, traditions, things like that really vary across the country. And that was really interesting to me to find out. It's the kind of stuff you just love to find out when you're working on cookbooks. Um, at the University of Washington, you know, their campus is on that beautiful Lake Washington, and people will sail up to the tailgate across the lake. Um, in Hawaii, um, the tradition is to have your little hibachi out in the, in the parking lot. And then they grill fish, and often it's fish they've caught themselves of different Hawaiian varieties with a little of that Hawaiian salt on top. And so they have all those little hibachis out there. Um, University of South Carolina, some of you may know about the cockabooses. Y'all familiar with the cockabooses? Um, there was an old train siding at the stadium. Um, they bought, I think it was 12 or 15 old cabooses, put them there, people could buy them and fix them up, and now they are tricked out. First of all, you can't even buy one now, but even if you could, it's going to run you six figures. But people trick those out on the inside with all kinds of fancy countertops, TVs, all this stuff. Um, and a lot of people just kind of stay there and watch the game and, you know, from there, because the food is better <laughs> in some cases. And the spot that I think is really considered the ultimate tailgate spot by a lot of publications is the Grove at Ole Miss. And many of you have probably read about that. Um, my publisher did not want to pay me to go to Hawaii and see the tailgating, but I did go to Ole Miss. I felt like I had to see that, and it is pretty amazing. Um, the grove is this a grove of trees in the center of campus, and so it's a beautiful spot to start with. And they allow people to come and set tents up in there, and they lay out a grid design so that there's some kind of organization to it. Um, they don't allow cars to drive up in there. They used to years ago, but they got concerned about the tree roots being damaged. But they do, and it's anybody. It's first come, first serve. Um, it's not restricted in any way. So all these tents, and, and it's not just the beauty of the surroundings and the fact that there's so many people in one place. The food. The food is good old southern food. Cheese straws, pulled mints fried chicken, chafing dishes, you know, with something good and hot in it, candelabras, tablecloths, chandeliers. I saw chandeliers in tailgate tents. Um, they had big stacks of outlets where you could plug in your crock pot or your lights. If you're there at night, you still just light everything up at night. And some people had the giant TVs and satellite dishes, so they would just settle down there, and again, sometimes they wouldn't even quite go into the stadium, depending on you know, how the team was doing. They might just stay there and watch the game right there with their, with their great tailgate. And the time that I went, it happened to be homecoming. And so I you know, went around talking to people, and I found this big group of about, there's about 15 or 20 people who were all tailgating together, and hung out with them and ate some of their great pound cake and, and all that, and I said, now, is, is this normal or, or are people doing more because it's homecoming? And she looked real puzzled at me and she kind of looked around. She says, no, they're like this all the time. <laughs> um, so it is 
It is a really amazing scene, and tailgating is not just for football either. Um, people tailgate for the Iditarod. Believe it or not, I found that out. Um, they will tailgate along the sides of the trail when the mushers are going down the trail and also hand food and like hot lattes to them. A lot, really, there's a group of Boy Scouts that make lattes and hand them to the mushers along the trail. They tail, you can tailgate for regattas on the Charles River. There's tailgating for that. There's tailgating, um, I, my, I understand, there's tailgating for the um, soccer games out here. Um, there used to be a tradition, it probably still is called um, PBF, Parents Bring Food. And there was a whole little schedule for the soccer games here at UNC. And I got a recipe from one of the moms for my book and told me about that. Some enchiladas that sound really, that are really good enchiladas. Um, and in Raleigh, we have to be proud that we brought tailgating to the National Hockey League. We taught them about tailgating with the Carolina Hurricanes. Because hockey is a cold weather sport. It's very cold. This involves ice. I have to be honest, I've never understood hockey. I've tried, but I still think ice belongs in my bourbon, not really on my sporting field. But we brought tailgating to the National Hockey League because, you know, even in the winter, it's pretty warm. And when the uh, Hurricanes were going for the Stanley Cup, I think that was in 06, um, the um, Canadian team that was playing them comes down and they're walking through the parking lot and they're just amazed. They've never seen anything like this. People roasting pigs and people cooking chicken and boiling shrimp and all this stuff. And they were amazed and quite pleased. And especially at the hospitality that, you know, it didn't matter that they were from the opposing team. They were offered food. And, and, and that's another great thing about the tailgate. We all, we all are kind of one little city, one little family during the tailgate, the wonderful things about it. And, you know, we do offer our hospitality to one and all who might want to sample our wares, you know, at least till kickoff. Then we might think differently. Um, but not everybody gets tailgating. Not everybody understands it. I have to tell you this story. When Fanfare came out, I got a call from the Martha Stewart Radio Network, and they wanted to interview me on the air. And it wasn't going to be Martha. I wasn't big enough. It was going to be one of her underlings. But um, they wanted me to talk about tailgating. They said, there's just one thing. There's just one little thing. I said, well, what is it? And they said, um, you can't use the word tailgate. And I said, what? This is a joke, right? And I said, no, no, you, you, you can't use the word tailgate. You can describe it but you can't use the word tailgate. I said, well, I asked like three calls about this. I kept getting calls. Now, you're not going to say tailgate, are you? You're not going to say tailgate, are you? I'm like, why? Why can't I say this? And they said, well, Martha has a thing about that word. She just has a thing about it. <laughs> that was the only explanation I got. So I had to do this entire radio interview without saying the name of the thing I was talking about. Um, and I knew because it was in my mind it would be the first thing out of my mouth, so you would have thought I was crazy. Before they were going to call me to do the phone interview, I was jumping up and down in my office yelling, tailgate, 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 to try and get it out of my system, so I wouldn't think about it anymore, but it went okay, but um, I still don't know why she has a thing about tailgating. Maybe it meant something different in prison, I don't know. Um, but the food traditions really vary around the country, too. At LSU, they're really fond of um, having those great big pots, you know, of jambalaya and gumbo and all those wonderful Louisiana dishes. Um, and I mentioned in Hawaii, they have the fish cooked on the little hibachis. And even up here, you know, of course, we have folks that have their cookers that they drive into the parking lot, and they'll do a whole pig or they'll do chickens. There's a guy who... Uh, NC State fan, he drives his cooker up into the lot, and once a year he has what he calls his chicken game. And that's when he does about a dozen chickens, barbecued chickens, on this cooker instead of his pig. And um, I, have his, I have his sauce recipe in fanfare. He was, I managed to pry that out of him with my natural charm. Um, 
people have asked what kind of food, or what kind of food should you take to a tailgate? What's the best kind of food? Well, first of all, it's the kind that you like. Um, second of all, there are kind of a couple ways of looking at it. Me personally, when we've tailgated, I always like to kind of keep it as simple as possible. I want to see the game. You know, I want to go to the game and have a good time and not be worried too much. And that's true too with what they call now home gating. You've probably heard that word. That's the concept of tailgating at home when you're watching a basketball game or a football game or something like that. I like to keep it simple so I can, I'm a sports fan, so I can enjoy the game. So I like to do things ahead of time. And a lot of the recipes in Fanfare and my other books too, actually, I'm really fond of do ahead things, I've noticed, um, are things that can be done the night before. Um, a marinated green bean salad, um, fried chicken. Rob and I were discussing this on the way over. We've decided that fried chicken is the ultimate tailgate food. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Most people like it, leaving vegans and vegetarians out of it. Most people like it. You can do it ahead. It tastes really good, warm or cold. I like cold fried chicken made the night before, put in the fridge. Um, and you don't have to resort to the box or the barrel because come on, we all know that the quality of the food at the tailgate affects the outcome of the game. <laughs> we all know that, right? And so we have to do our part, you know, for the team by providing the best food that we can. And if you've never fried chicken, yes, it is a little messy, but it's not that difficult with pan frying, which is the way that I do it. I don't do the whole deep frying, battering, all that, just a nice soak in buttermilk, which I insist on. And not just because I wrote a whole book on buttermilk, but because it, it really, makes the chicken delicious. Um, but it really is not, it's gonna taste so much better than what you get at a drive through If you've never tried it, try it just once and see if you don't agree with me. Um, the um, cheese ball that I hope y'all had a little bit of out there, the blue cheese ball, did y'all like that? That's something that can be done two, three days ahead and have it ready for your home gating at home or to take to your game. Um, deviled eggs, again, really great do-ahead. It'll make the vegans and the veg well, not the vegans, but the vegetarians happy. Um, and again, I don't say that just because I also wrote a whole book on deviled eggs, but that they, uh, they are a great tailgate food in my book. There's some organizational tips that I think are pretty good that I found when I was working on Fanfare. If you're going for the whole season, you're going to be going to the game every week, um, I found it useful to keep a big bin and just keep all your disposables in there, your plates and your forks and your napkins, and then you stick that in the garage or in a corner of the kitchen, and then all you have to do is pick that up and put it in the car when you're ready to go. And you don't have to worry about things like forgetting the tickets. I mean, you've got everything ready in there. Um, if you do like to grill on site, I know there are a lot of people that like to grill at the tailgate. Um, you know, make sure that you've got your fuel of choice and that all that's ready and all in one place. Um, have to be careful with um, afterwards, when you finish with the grilling and want to walk on up to the game, um, don't stick the hot coals in your car. Um, that's happened, unless you want to find a cinder when you get back to your car. Um, so just, you have to be careful with, with that. Um, and it's not quite as warm today as it has been, but of course when you're talking about tailgating on a very warm day, ice, plenty of ice, and then go buy some more ice. Um, and it's also a good idea if you're going to grill at the site, maybe have separate coolers for your prepared foods and your raw meat in a whole separate cooler with more ice so you, there's no chance of any of that cross-contamination going on. Just have separate coolers is a good idea. Um, and more and more people are watching games at home, the home gating idea. Um, and there's another food that I have to say is really fantastic for that that I have a recipe and fanfare for, and that's sausage balls. It was the very first thing I ever made for a game were sausage balls. It was 35 years ago. I was working at the Salisbury Post, my first job out of journalism school. We were all poor, none of us had any money. And I was the only person on the staff with a color television. 
So everybody would end up at my house, whether I invited them or not, to watch basketball games. We also had a very liberal editor that when the ACC tournament used to be all around midday, he didn't care if we would disappear for a couple of hours. You know, he knew where we were and he knew he could just call my house and that's where the whole staff would be. Um, and I wanted to make something to feed people. You know, I'm a southern woman. And so I made these sausage balls and they were easy to make. You can freeze them. You know, they're great. And so, you know, guys and I are watching this game and there was a really um, unfortunate call against our players in blue. And one of my guests expressed his displeasure by flinging a sausage ball at my television set. Um, so that's become a tradition at my house as well. We do fling a sausage ball or two, do we not, on occasion? When perhaps the other shade of blue is playing us? Yes. I mean, the whole thing about tailgating is it's a chance to have fun. It's really so many things. I mean, it's, it can be a family reunion. It can be a big party. It can be just a chance to be outside on a really nice fall day. And the really fantastic thing about the tailgate is that everybody's a winner. Everybody's a winner at the tailgate. It's the ultimate ex expression of optimism and excitement. And no matter what happens on the field, you're going to eat great. Does anybody have any questions about food or tailgating or anything like that? Yeah. Are you tailgating outside the United States? I haven't checked on that. That's a good idea, though, especially now since um, um, NFL and NASCAR, which I didn't even mention, has become so popular in other countries. Boy, NASCAR, they put us to shame. They, those guys tailgate for a week. I mean, that's amazing. I went to see the Bristol race when I was working on the book, the spring race. They have two races a year. And uh, just amazing. But that would be a good question to ask since I wrote that book, since it's become so popular in other parts of the world. Anything else? Well, it's longer. I mean, people do stay out there for a week. Um, and a lot of people do have the big TVs because they're sitting <clears throat> watching things before the race actually starts. I mean, with NASCAR, there's like, you can watch qualifying, you can go to all these other auxiliary things before the actual race. Um, and so they're out there for good for the week. And so there's a lot of like bigger cooking going on because they're there for so long. Um, people roasting things and some of the races um, take place well, you have to go earlier in the morning, so there's breakfast food. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Very loud. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, did you get a chance to do any research on how big the industry is around, you know, like what you define as still eating? So when, when you start to look at, you know, all the food that's purchased and the beverages and grills and accoutrements, I mean, it, it seems like there's just it has since I wrote I wrote this book a few years ago and it's really exploded since then you see cars with special attachments to hold your stuff and um, especially if you add the home gating idea into it which some food company has trademarked by the way um, if you add that portion into it it's a huge 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 business now I, I don't have figures on that maybe good for me to look at that since I wrote the book because it's just gone up I remember us being here for a game and walking around. This was years ago, and some car company, you remember that? They had a car up there that had been like specially designed for tailgate. It was some kind of concept car that had some kind of a back area that had a built-in cooler and all this stuff in it. So it's... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, ha that's, that happens at Ole Miss, too. They have companies that will come and set your tents up for you. Although there's a whole thing going on at Ole Miss right now because they changed the rules and everybody's upset about that, the rules for using the Grove. But, yeah, there's cottage industries or companies that have sprung up to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Go in and set up the tents, yeah. 
So it's a so it's a uh, a job creator. It's football. I mean, basketball is not really a tailgate sport because a lot of the games are at night and they're at different times and and. Yeah, they're during the week and different times, and it doesn't. Baseball doesn't really lend itself to tailgating either. I did, I found only one place that really did any kind of a tailgating at a baseball stadium, and I think that was um, Milwaukee, the Brewers, because um, years ago their old stadium, the Green Bay Packers, had used that stadium for a while while their the Packers stadium was being renovated. And so that kind of brought the tail, and they liked the tailgate idea. So when they built the new Brewers Stadium, people said, we want tailgating facilities. We want space allowed for that. So, but usually, and again, I think that's because baseball stadiums are usually in downtown areas. The games are at different times. There's more of a tradition, I think, of going and watching a game at a bar than if you're not able to go. And also ballpark food is kind of legendary. Um, Yeah. I mean, as far as the time I went, just based on my one sample, um, it seemed to pretty much reflect the student body. Um, now there was, it was before they got rid of the flag and it was when, when I went, they had just changed their mascot. Their mascot used to be a rebel. And that was the controversy when I was, went down there was over changing the mascot. And you had, you did have some people that had like Confederate uniforms hung up in their tailgate tent and, and things like that. But it seemed to be pretty, I guess it would pretty much reflect the student body. No, I didn't go to any of those. Um, I talked to some, but I didn't, I didn't go to any. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I think that is, I think that's one thing that makes a good tailgate environment is a nice environment. You know, something's attractive, and then someplace we can get a lot of people in one place. That's one thing that this campus kind of is a, is a little bit of a disadvantage because we have like a parking lot here, a parking lot there. And um, I guess the Friday Center lot where we usually go is the closest to having everything, space for lots of people to be together. Historically, was there ever tailgating here? I don't think so. The on the, on the not, not that I can remember. And we went to school here. Do you remember ever seeing that? No, I don't either. You know, there were the guys that dug the pit behind your dorm and roasted a pig. That's really true. He was in, um, he was in Teague. He, he was in Teague dorm. And these guys dug a pit behind the dorm one time. And this was probably in, what, 74, 73, something like that. Um, these guys go and, these students go and dig a pit and they're going to roast a pig in the ground behind Teague dorm. And um, they did. And guys in suits came and signed off on it and stared at it for a while. And then, yeah, they roasted a whole pig back there, and then the dorm came and ate. <laughs> but that wasn't for a tailgate. That was just because they felt like it. It, it is much more of a big deal than when we were in school here in the 70s. And the RV, the whole RV thing has grown. Like if you go out to Friday Center lot, um, there'll be people out there in RVs as well, usually the opposing team. Um, and I think part of that is you see it at NASCAR too because people have those big TVs and they can come and park and then watch another game or watch something and then go into the game. I wonder if it's also part of 
tailgating becoming more of an event for people, that it's like, I don't want to say like a vacation, but something that's more of an event, and you might go and stay for a day or longer and, you know, make it more of a family reunion kind of thing or going with friends. Because usually at the Friday Center lot, it's like a bunch of people who are traveling together, you know, and so it's like a party. It's like a moving party, and it's a chance for a bunch of people to get together, you know, once or twice a year. Yeah. Oh, you see that all the time. You see, you see there's competitions for everything. You see that all the time now. Um, I'm not sure I want the tailgate to be a competition. I want us all to embrace each other around a big plate of fried chicken. Hopefully everybody wins. <laughs> yes, everybody wins at the tailgate because nobody's lost yet. Oh, yeah, no, no question, no question. I went into writing my book with that idea, and it was verified. I do have to say that the SEC kicks everybody else's behind with tailgating. What is it, Georgia? When Georgia plays Florida, they call, is that the one they call the world's largest cocktail party? Yeah, because it's just like this huge, 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 huge thing. And, uh, yeah, I, I think we do have it all over them. And some of it's weather, some of it's weather. Yeah, you would get all the fried chicken you want. Well, I think anything that can encourage a space for as many people as possible to be together, because I think that's part of what builds the excitement if you've got, like, like here's a little area where five people, here's a little area where five people. It, it, the excitement builds, I think, more if you've got one area where a lot of people can be. Um, I think the attractiveness is sort of secondary to that. I don't know what y'all think, but having a lot of people together, I think, is what's important. I think that's why, even though the Friday Center is certainly not the most attractive you know, place, I think that's why that parking lot kind of works because you do have, a, it's a large space. You can have all kinds of people there and walk around, you know, because part of the fun is walking around to see what other people are doing and how, like, you know, oh, I like that. I need to get me a tent like that, you know, or, and see what other people are doing and talk about the game and get all excited. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, we're going to beat Virginia today. Yeah. Um, you know, and build up that excitement. So I think maybe that's the important thing is having a space um, and I don't know, drive around Take pictures of people's tailgates and post them. Yeah, the critical mass. And there may not be anything you can really do about that with parking the way it is. No, they don't. I do have to say, yeah, that would be fantastic. I would totally take light rail. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. That's good to think about. Yeah, that's a, that's a good thing to be thinking about because parking decks are the most depressing place on earth to try to tailgate. I mean, I saw some guys doing it when we came in, but uh, oh my gosh, it's so depressing. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Because you have a little, it's a little city for the day, a little city of Tar Heel fans. Who does? Oh. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was just going to make a point, though. You know, it's, uh, if we wanted to create, like, a, a new designated uh, tailgating area, I, I know the guy who can go fundraise and find the money for the person who always is. Always is. Just go raise the If we had some better publicity, <laughs> <laughs> well, I can I can tell them what to cook. Um, well, you know, on state property, you're not supposed to have alcohol, so that's yeah. But as I say in my book, as we say, as I say in my book, though, we have we all know about the mystery, the the red plastic cup, and the mystery of its contents. Um, but you are not, and, I, and one thing I say in the book is please check on those policies where you're going to tailgate because some, you know, you don't want to get in trouble. But yeah, we all have the red cup and we don't really know what's in it. But yeah, you're not supposed to. And um, I had a thought for a minute, it left me. Oh, at NC State, they have a lot of big parking lots because it's so close to the, um, the fairgrounds and everything. So they do have the critical mass there. The downside of the critical mass happens sometimes at NC State tailgates, which is people get drunk and out of control. So that is the thing to look for. But now NC State Stadium allows pass outs. And I don't mean passing out drunk. I mean passing out, they allow you to come out. They allow you to go out at halftime and come back in. So that might, if they were willing to do away with that, they might limit some of that in my opinion. But that is an issue if you're gonna have a lot of people in one place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that that is that is the downside of so many people in one place. There's always going to be some people that get out of control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It is in the center of the campus. Because, yeah, that's right. I mean, NC State, they, you know, there's stadiums way out from the campus. Yeah. Well, you can do things that may enable it to happen, but, yeah, you can't make it happen. Like the Grove, that just happened. I'll have to get me a chafing dish, yes. I don't know that it's affected it because that would be more people who have not tailgated. They're, they want to go buy something. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that's affected it too much. Well, yeah, I mean, you can always cater your tailgate. I mean, at Ole Miss, a lot of people do that. Yeah. Well, I think it is, but. <laughs> Anything else? Any more questions? 
Well, thank you.